Welcome to The Savvy Investor, where it's our job to help you be secure in any economy. The Bush tax cuts expire at the end of this year and your estate taxes are going to go up. Today we're going to explore the steps you need to take before the end of the year to protect yourself. Welcome to The Savvy Investor. You can have financial security in any economy. Today is the day you can take control of your financial future and eliminate worry about your retirement forever. Each week, The Savvy Investor helps viewers just like you create and grow wealth, protect and preserve it, and distribute it in the most tax-efficient manner. And now, The Savvy Investor with your host, Michael Connett. On today's show, we're going to be talking about estate planning and the things you need to be looking for. We're going to discuss wills, trusts, powers of attorney, advanced care directives, and the tax cuts that are coming up. Now, we're joined today by estate planning attorney Chester Hobbs, and he's going to give us some tips and things you need to do between now and the end of the year, and just things you need to be thinking about in general when it comes to estate planning. Before we get there, we're going to talk about some things in the news like we do here each and every week on The Savvy Investor. Now, out of the AICPA, the, uh, for, for four CPAs, um, they have what they're talking about is the new normal. And Chester's going to address this a little bit further. But basically what the AICPA is talking about here is that January 1st, 2013, we're going to have new estate tax laws. And they're going to go back to $1 million, which is what they were back in 2001. So you think about that. Your assets have maybe grown over these years. You've saved a little bit more money. Yes, your house went up and down, but it's still worth more than it was in 2001. And the estate tax rules go back to a million dollars. For many of us, that's going to cause significant hardship and taxes to our heirs. So you need to be thinking about that in the near future. Um, from Forbes, some great estate, tax, uh, estate planning tips. Uh, Ford says uh, offset taxes with insurance. And what they're talking about here is, especially if it goes back to a million dollars, the estate tax at the federal level is 55%. The state of Maryland, it is 16%. Uh, states across the country, Virginia, it's anywhere from 6 to 15%. Pennsylvania, the same type of thing. So across the country, there's significant estate taxes that are at the state level and up to 55% at the federal level. That's pretty significant cut for your heirs to, to, to have to suffer through. So what Forbes is talking about is if when you're sitting down with somebody like Chester or financial planners like us, if it turns out that you're going to own a ton of money in taxes, or even if it's four or $500,000 in taxes, you have a choice. You can buy life insurance and have that money go tax-free, and if you do it correctly, estate tax-free to your heirs, or you can choose to pay the IRS $500,000. And it's really your choice, but Obviously, from our perspective, from Chester's perspective, it probably makes better sense to give it to your heirs rather than give it to Uncle Sam. And, and finally, um, from the Wall Street Journal, tax tips, estate tax tips for married couples. Um, and thanks to a credible deal we have right now, they gave us a, a, a kind of a little windfall here between now and the end of the year. So you literally have, what, about 30 days to get this done. Right now, you can exempt about five million, just a hair over five million per person from estate taxes. So a married couple can save about 10.1, 10.2 million dollars in estate tax. And think about this: in 2012, you can protect a little over 10 million dollars from estate taxes, or you can wait till 2013, and you can protect two million, a million for you and a million for your spouse. And the Wall Street Journal was really hammering in on this important issue. Because think about that, eight more million dollars taxed at 55%. That's a huge four and a half million dollars going to, to, the, to the federal government for tax purposes because you failed to plan between now and the end of the year. And that's straight out of the Wall Street Journal. And they're not even attorneys. Chester is going to tell you how important it is to make sure you're planning between now and the end of the year. And quite frankly, you don't have a lot of time. So you need to get on this if you're worth more than $5 million between you and your spouse. Now, we're going to take a little break here, but when we come back, we're going to talk to Chester Hobbs. We're going to sit down and ask him his thoughts, not only on the tax issues, but on things you need to think about for your wills, your powers of attorney, your trusts, and advanced care directives. You're watching Mike Kinnett on The Savvy Investor. We'll be right back. 
Join the host of the nationally syndicated TV series, The Savvy Investor, and best-selling author Michael Kinnett for this very important, life-changing workshop. Michael and his team of advisors from across the country have been helping families create and live the retirement they envisioned by carefully crafting a retirement income plan that can withstand any financial crisis. Michael will give you the tools you need to make sound investment choices and help you prepare for your golden years. At this workshop, you'll learn more than just where to invest your money. Michael will also share tax strategies that could save you and your family thousands in tax dollars. You'll learn important estate planning techniques that can help you avoid the high cost of a nursing home, as well as reduce or completely eliminate any estate tax. Now you can join him in person for these very informative workshops. They could be the answer to creating the safe and secure retirement you deserve. Call 866-597-1040 to see if you qualify to attend one of these workshops with best-selling author Michael Kinnett, host of The Savvy Investor. Seating is limited, so call 866-597-1040 to join us. If you're in retirement or retiring in the next three to five years, you must read Michael Kinnett's best-selling book, Surviving the Perfect Storm. Best-selling author and National Quill Award winner Michael Kinnett's Surviving the Perfect Storm is a must-read to prepare for your golden years. This amazing book can be yours absolutely free, but you must call 866-597-1040 now. Supplies are limited, so be one of the first 25 callers to receive your free limited edition autograph copy of Surviving the Perfect Storm. Call 866-597-1040 now. Welcome back to The Savvy Investor. I'm your host, Michael Kinnett. Today we're talking about state planning and the things you need to think about. Wills, trusts, powers of attorney, and advanced care directives. And, you know, planning for your state can be very intimidating and overwhelming, but ignoring it has dire consequences. Think about ignoring your investments or your health. You know, when you do those things, unintended consequences happen. For example, remember Terry Schiavo in Florida and the mess that created? What about not having the proper plan in place and your stuff going to the state of Maryland? Well, today we're gonna to discuss with the state planning expert, and I know Chester doesn't like that. There's some rules against that. I'm certainly gonna give him that plug, even though he's not allowed to call himself. But I'm joined today by Chester Hobbs, and we're gonna to talk today about some of the things you need to think about. How to reduce your taxes, how to avoid the, the nasty problem of probate. It's not, it's not that it's a horrible experience. It's just mostly a, a pain in the backside. It's tedious. You can do it easy. You can do it easy, but it's, it's a tedious process. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the steps you need to take to avoid probate, the basic documents that you need to have, and more, most importantly, from my perspective, at least right now, that nasty tax consequence that happens at the end of this year. Chester, welcome to The Savvy Investor. Nice to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, so let's talk, first of all, the, the, the basic documents you need to have. There's some simple documents that everybody should have as part of their estate planning across the board. Absolutely. What, what uh, do people need? Uh, basically, a will a financial power of attorney, um, appointment of a healthcare agent, a medical directive, kind of the same thing, and a living will, which overlaps in some of its purposes, but people, I believe, should have both the appointment of the healthcare agent and a living will. And the living will, I mean, we're just gonna kind of go back to that yeah. whole Terry Schiavo thing. The living will and the, the, the advanced care directive, that's kind of what Terry Schiavo was missing in Exactly, her. she was missing both of those. The person who was, she, the, the appointment of a healthcare agent would appoint the person she wanted to be a spokesperson. Really the biggest issue in Terry Schiavo was, were her parents the ones who were supposed to speak for her, or was her husband the one to speak for her? She had never designated right. anybody. And if she had designated that person, there would have been less fighting, less friction between those two parties who had different views of her medical diagnosis. And certainly certainly a hospital is not going to pull the plug, so to speak, unless there's clear authority on somebody's part. Absolutely. And so if you have no spokesperson, then you have two people who pretend to be or proclaim to be the spokesperson and they're saying completely opposite things, the hospital is going to back away, put their hands up and say, go to court and let the judge tell us what to do. Right. Now, the advanced care directive does some very specific things. That's more directed towards while I'm alive and need somebody to help make decisions for me? Well, that's correct. The advanced care directive, uh, it does not necessarily mean in the end stage where you're on life support. It can be any time you can't, the medical decision needs to be made for you, but you can't express your own wishes uh, for any number of medical reasons. So if you can't speak for yourself, the agent would speak for you, but it's certainly not uh, should we terminate life support. It can be, should we use course A or course B of treatment? Should we uh, go for surgery or wait longer? Those right. decisions. And so it could be anything from Alzheimer's to you know, dementia to, well, quite frankly, I'm just old and tired and I, and I want my family to be part of the decision-making process. Absolutely. Right. Now, the living will is a little bit more specific. That's really uh, terminal, it's talking end about of life. End stage. It's your statement right. of what you want done in an end stage if you get to a permanently vegetative, permanently comatose uh, end-stage condition of a terminal illness, 
and you can no longer speak is what you would be saying to the world is your wishes. Because that really is what matters, is what that person wants done with the determination of their life. It's not the hospital's right. obligations, it's not right. the family's wishes, it's what does that patient want to say about the termination of their life, and right. that's what matters. And, now, and one of the things that we tell clients all the time with regards to the living will is that, look, you know, in the state of Maryland especially, but most states have statutes that allow the family to make the medical decision. Even in Florida with Terry Schiavo, um, had the family, her husband and the parents, been on the same page, the living will would have been irrelevant because the family could have said, you know, keep her hooked up to machines or pull the plug, as they say. But the, because they had opposing views, that's where the legal um, snag, uh, snag happened. And so in Maryland, the same thing. The family can make the decision, but you don't want to leave it to them because you're basically telling the kids, make the decision to pull the plug on mom and dad. And I, I got news for you. We all have unresolved mommy and daddy issues. So put it in writing. Tell them what you want. Take that stress and pressure away from them. Oh, it's only fair if you're going right. to ask somebody to pull the plug to tell them under what circumstances you would want that done, right. to leave it up to them. And I've had clients say, well, I'll just leave it up to my children. And I say, absolutely not. Right. That's, so right, right. That, that's wrong. It's wrong. It's right. completely right. unfair. Right. Right. You exactly. need to tell your children what you want done. It's your statement. Now, what about, what about the, for me personally, I'm, I'm very big about that whole pain medication side. Right. You know? um, and, and, there's always two schools of thought on it. If, if you want to be hooked up to painkillers, you know, morphine, the drip, and stuff like mm -hmm. that, th there's this thought that, you know, maybe I won't be um, uh, alive, or not, not alive, but I won't be able to be conscious to have a, a, a conversation with my kids. And I always flip it back to them that, you know, your kid, kids have a choice. They can see you curled up in the fetal position in pain so that you can tell them that you love them, right. which is, from my perspective, pretty meaningless on the deathbed. Right. Right. So I always encourage, the, the one place I do kind of push clients in one direction is take the pain medication. Don't let your kids see you in that condition. Um, I, I try not to influence their decisions across the board, but for me, that's that one big thing. Don't let your kids see, see you that way. It's, it's not good for absolutely. them. Absolutely. I've had very few clients resist the pain and medication in the documents, and I've always tried to convince them you know, and go through that scenario as you just laid it out. Right. I mean, the pain medication is there to help you. Uh, don't, don't refuse it in the documents that you can't change once you get to that point. Right, right. <laughs> Leave it in there. What about, what about powers of attorney? There's, there's a couple schools of thought. Maryland recently passed, well, a couple years ago, and they've, they've tinkered with it over the last couple of years. Maryland passed a, a statutory power of attorney, um, which basically codified the rules for powers of attorney that deal with with financial issues. And, and tell us a little bit about the, the two schools of thoughts, the durable power of attorney, the general power of attorney, and the statutory. Okay, what happened is there was, you know, a power of attorney prior to October 2010 when that law went in, it was enacted, there was a routine rejection of powers of attorney, powers of attorney that were otherwise valid. Uh, right. Banks or any financial institution could just routinely reject them at their wish. And it was really no downside to the bank for rejecting it. It was the safer thing to do. They had a policy. They would reject it. And the legislature said when they reject it, that forces us then into a court system with a guardianship proceeding. And we really don't want that. We want banks to rely on these. And, and, and just to interject, the, the old powers of attorney before 2000 and October 2010 were really, you know, I, I explained it, it's, it's all this common law, all these things that we thought would work, and we basically filled, you know, eight or ten pages with everything in the kitchen sink. We just fling against it, okay. and we hope that we address every issue that anybody could have. Right. And like you said, financial institutions said, look, we want more certainty. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we're protected. If I'm going to move mom's money from one spot to another, or we're going to make withdrawals on behalf of some attorney in fact, we want more protection. Right. And so they would just reject it unless they were 100% satisfied. And what the legislature did is they've created a statutory power of attorney that said, if the power of attorney looks exactly like this as published in the statute, right. Then if a bank rejects it and it's proven valid in court, the bank has to pay all the attorney's fees. Which is even better. Which is even better. So it's sort of now there's a downside to the bank for rejecting what are obviously otherwise good powers of attorney. Right. The problem, well, I, I call it a problem. Maybe that isn't the right word. The situation that arose is now that they've published it in the code, the code only gets changed so often. Right. But the world changes rapidly, right. far more quickly than the law. Right. And so there are things that they didn't put in the statutory power of attorney that I like to see. Right. Uh, withdrawing from IRAs, making gifts. And we actually have just recently added to our standard power of attorney 
uh, a digital assets clause that enables you to get close Google accounts and get into Facebook pages and shut them down and make transfers on PayPal, right. which you couldn't do right. with older powers of attorney. And, and, and I think one of the most important things, you know, as a financial planner, um, we look at more than just the estate planning. I know you do yeah. as well. But for us, we're always looking at things like Medicaid planning as a possibility right. and having the gifting in there. That's a, that's a section you have to add to it. Right. Very, very important. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation. We're going to talk a little bit about wills, a little bit about trusts, and then we're going to tackle this estate tax issue that's coming up. Um, I'm joined today by Chester Hobbs, estate plan attorney. I'm Mike Kinnett. You're watching The Savvy Investor, and we'll be right back. Remember when life was simpler, when things didn't move quite so fast, and the world didn't seem so complex? Remember that? We do. And as the world around us has continued to speed up, becoming more complicated, more and more uncertain, we have managed to keep things simple, providing sound, easy to understand financial advice and proven solutions for the road ahead. From investments and insurance to tax reduction strategies, estate planning solutions, and guaranteed retirement income you cannot outlive, we're your single point of contact, a single call, a voice you recognize well, and a partner who will be by your side for the entire journey. We can't stop the world around us, but we can help ensure you're prepared for what's to come. For a special free guide entitled 10 Things to Know About Retirement Income, simply contact us today. Join the host of the nationally syndicated TV series, The Savvy Investor, and best-selling author Michael Kinnett for this very important, life-changing workshop. Michael and his team of advisors from across the country have been helping families create and live the retirement they envision by carefully crafting a retirement income plan that can withstand any financial crisis. Michael will give you the tools you need to make sound investment choices and help you prepare for your golden years. At this workshop, you'll learn more than just where to invest your money. Michael will also share tax strategies that could save you and your family thousands in tax dollars. You'll learn important estate planning techniques that can help you avoid the high cost of a nursing home, as well as reduce or completely eliminate any estate tax. Now you can join them in person for these very informative workshops. They could be the answer to creating the safe and secure retirement you deserve. Call 866-597-1040 to see if you qualify to attend one of these workshops with best-selling author Michael Kinnett, host of The Savvy Investor. Seating is limited, so call 866-597-1040 to join us. Now keep in mind that just like any tool, there's the right tool for the right job and a wrong tool for the wrong job. We have just scratched the surface here, and you'll want to know more about how today's conversation might or might not fit your needs. Ask about fees, surrender charges, market risk, interest rate risks, how the guarantees work, liquidity, and much more. Remember, the right tool for the right job. Welcome back to The Savvy Investor. I'm your host, Michael Kinnett. I'm joined by estate planning expert, Chester Hobbs. When we left our break, we said we are going to address a couple different issues. We want to talk about wills, we want to talk about trusts, and I want to talk about the expiration of the Bush tax credits at the end of this year. But before we go there, like we do every week here on The Savvy Investor, I want to take some viewer mail. We know that, a, that, a, that retirement planning, estate tax planning, tax planning in general, all these things are daunting and overwhelming. Send us your questions at the Savvy Investor at PrimeFS.com. We answer questions each and every week. And even if you just don't make it onto the show, we address your questions immediately back to you. So the Savvy Investor at PrimeFS.com. Let's take a look at some of these emails. Now, from Matt in Columbia, out of Columbia, Maryland, um, a bank manager told him to put his son on his joint owner so that his son can access the bank accounts. And basically what he's saying is that if something happens, I assume, I, mean, I get this all the time, if something happens to him, um, he wants one of two things to happen. Either A, he wants his son to access the money so it doesn't go through probate, or B, he wants his son to be able to get to the money to help pay expenses. Right. And from my perspective, joint ownership with anybody other than a significant other or your spouse is typically a really bad idea. Oh, I agree. So what, what's, what's, what are Matt's alternatives here? Well, Matt can uh, do a power, prepare a power of attorney, or his father can prepare a power of attorney naming Matt the power of attorney. And, and even without creating an actual power of attorney document, the two could go to the bank and sign a power of attorney card over the account. That would give Matt the access to the account in the event the father could no longer transact on the account, but it creates now a fiduciary duty 
that Matt is not entitled to use the money for anything other than his father. And, and I want to talk about that because okay. to me the big problem is, is if something happens to Matt, and, you know, if, in today's litigious society, now I'm an attorney mm -hmm. and you're an attorney, we don't do that stuff. I mean, and it's really scary now. I actually see, you know, in the old days they were called ambulance chasers. Now they actually like advertise the ambulance on television. Right. But we don't do that stuff, and, right. I, and I get that. But nevertheless, we know that they find these ambulance chasers, no parents put their kids' name on their stuff. Absolutely. And if, if, the, if, if, if Matt gets in a car accident and injures you, and you can't work for 10 years. And I sue Matt. And you sue Matt. That $250,000 coverage that Matt has for his, you know, even $500,000, it's not enough to pay you for 10 years of not being able to work. Right. And, and, and what a, a slippery attorney will do, those ambulance chasers will do, is they'll come after Matt's dad and take the money out of the account. Or at least Matt's dad will spend a lot of money protecting and, it. Exactly. And so it's a, it's a simpler version, the power of attorney, or going down to the bank and have him sign. Absolutely. Now, what about the whole idea of the ownership where, so he avoids the probate? Well, there are other things you can do to avoid probate. You could make Matt, the son, a, power, a payable on death or transfer on death account. So dad exactly. controls, keeps the ownership until death, right. avoids any creditor claims from Matt, uh, but on death, it passes outside of probate directly to the son. Exactly, exactly. And, I, and, I, and it just kills me when, because I hear bank, I hear, we have clients come in and I hear them tell us all the time that that's what the bank people told them. Well, just put your name on the account. Just put your kid's name on the account. Right. I'd like to beat him with a stick. Now, and I think this is pronounced correctly, Micah in Denver, uh, he attended a, a revocable living trust seminar and the presenter suggested that a joint trust was correct. He's, he's questioning this because his parents have their own trust. They each have an individual trust. What's the difference? Well, an individual trust is exactly as it sounds. Each of them would have a trust for the benefit of themselves, and then on the death of the first, that trust would then be for the benefit of the surviving spouse. Which is traditionally the way we've seen trust designed. Right. Uh, the, it really is just the mechanics. The end tax result, the end distribution is really the same. In a joint trust, you would joint, draft one trust document with both parties as the settler, both parties as trustee, both parties as co-beneficiaries, and then on the death of the first, that trust simply continues for the second. Right. Yeah. Now, now the, my problem with them uh, that, that I don't like about the joint trust is that I think people become complacent with them. And so when the per first person dies, the surviving spouse doesn't really think about the fact that there are things that need to be done at the death of the first spouse to make sure, because all the assets are still jointly held. Right. And you have to bifurcate these to take advantage of to the tax it. things. And, and so, so Micah, from, from my position, a joint trust is not the answer. Pay for two single trusts. I personally think that's a better choice, you know, and it, it Well, and I hear exactly what you're saying, but if one spouse dies, the surviving spouse then needs to do some affirmative action with right. the deceased spouse's trust, which is going to force it into the tax designed pot that they created way in back when place. in the first place. Right. Whereas if the surviving spouse can simply continue transacting business with the trust assets, they're not going to elect and place and separate the assets into the two separate funds, which create the tax effect, right. which was the purpose of the trust and, in and, the first place. And, and when, you know, when, when, when mom or dad dies, the simple thing is, you know, they have, they're so overwhelmed to begin with, just to not do anything is a lot simpler than have to go through the steps of bifurcating everything at that point. Absolutely. Now, the other thing I see, and since we're talking about trusts, um, the other thing that I have problems with trusts is that not the trusts themselves, although I think they're oversold and overused, because mm -hmm. um, I think you can avoid probate without using a trust if it makes sense. Because uh, certainly the biggest as aspect from my perspective, trusts avoid probate. Right. And certainly if you have property in more than one state, it's a great idea. Right. Um, I think trusts are great for controlling assets beyond the grave mm -hmm. when you want to um, minimize the, the angst in the family. Right. Um, but t trust themselves, and this is where I always have a problem, people think you have to have a trust in order to protect yourself from taxes. And that just isn't the case. Absolutely not. And that is right. the biggest misconception I see every day right. is that people think by avoiding probate, they avoid taxes. And, and probate and taxes are not at all related. You can have probate without taxes, right. and you can have trusts with taxes just as well as the other way around. Right. And, and, the, and the tax planning in a trust is the same tax planning you can do in a will. Absolutely. It's the same language. Absolutely. Now, the other thing that I'm always concerned about is, is that probably about 75 to 80 percent of the trusts that we see come into our office when we're examining the trust and we're examining the trust documents, um, the trusts aren't funded, right. which is a problem. And a few years ago, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, they kind of changed the rules for how um, 
qualified money, IRAs, 401ks, that thing, how those things can be passed through the trust. And we see trust language that doesn't accommodate that. Absolutely. You need very specific language to pass an IRA or 401k and have it continue tax deferred in a trust. If that language is not in the trust document, that's going to be immediately taxed on the death of that owner. A disaster. Absolutely. A disaster. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Um, Let's talk a little bit about wills, just the whole general idea of how a will works. I okay. mean, it's, it's a pretty simple document, but people are very, very intimidated about it. Right. What, what's, the, what's the basic purpose of a will? A will is to, is to handle and manage the distribution of assets that are titled solely in a deceased person's right. name. So a husband and wife, my wife and I own a house together. When I die, it automatically goes to my wife. The will doesn't do anything. The will doesn't do anything. And right. even if the will said it, the house was supposed to go to someone else, it's ineffective because the will doesn't control that. So it's just like my car. When I bought my last car, I was by myself and I didn't think about putting my wife's name on it. Mm -hmm. In order to get the, the will, the, the car to my wife, the will has to go through probate right. because somebody has to sign the, back, sign the title. And that's the will. The will gives her permission via the court to sign the back of it. Right. The probate process is basically allows the state to appoint a person who can sign the back of a title, sign a check or a checking account withdrawal, close accounts when the only name on those assets or accounts is a deceased person. Right. So, so folks, today we, we address some key issues. And, and unfortunately, we're running short on time because I want to address a little bit more about the Bush tax cuts. But suffice it to say that there are some serious ramifications between now and the end of the year. If you don't get in to talk to somebody like Chester or, or even your financial planner to talk to them about estate tax issues, this is a serious problem. Remember now, January 1st, it goes back to a million dollars. Now, the, the kind of the coffee cooler thing is, you know, is maybe three and a half million or something, but we just don't know. And better to take advantage of it today right. th than hope for the best later, right? I mean, okay. you should always plan for the worst and hope for the best. You have a great opportunity. We've never had this opportunity other than 2011 and 2012, where you could give away $5 million of property without any incurring any gift or estate tax. That's never been in the law before, and it's not scheduled to be in the law after December 31st. Right. So limited opportunity. Now, Chester's locally in Towson, and you can call my offices, 866-597-1040, 866-597-1040. I can hook you up. I know for a fact he's promised me he will work 24 hours a day for the next month to make sure he takes care of viewers. Um, you can join us here each and every week on The Savvy Investor. We talk about issues just like this, wills, powers of attorney, trusts, the whole nine yards. Join us here next week on The Savvy Investor. Have a great week. If you'd like more information about today's show, you can contact our offices with our toll-free number, 866-597-1040, or visit us on the web at www.thesavvyinvestortv.com. When you visit our website, sign up for our free weekly newsletter where we give you tidbits each week to help you make smart money choices. Every retiree's goal, from our perspective, is to take the least amount of risk possible to accomplish your goals. Too often, financial advisors and stockbrokers assess your risk tolerance just because you can tolerate the risk doesn't mean you have to accept it. Remember, at the end of the day, it isn't how much you make, it's how much you keep.